I'm going to. All right. So I just wanted to share that uh, my name is Donna Heitmanek. I'm the um, president of the Literacy Task Force of Wisconsin. Our mission is to promote literacy throughout the state of Wisconsin, literacy initiatives. And um, we thought that this would be a great way to help promote literacy, not only in our own state, but across the nation by highlighting what folks, what administrators are doing to help promote the science of reading within your uh, schools and your districts. So we have the honor of having Dr. New Dr. <laughs> Yay! Ernie Ortiz. Yes, you deserve that. And uh, Ernie joins us from the AIM Academy after having served as principal of the McDonald Elementary School in the Centennial School District near Philadelphia and is an energetic, dynamic, and passionate instructional leader with over 20 years of experience in public education. His literacy leadership has advanced the science of reading in his school and contributed to how teachers are trained and students are educated across the district, and I might add nation. He has also supported education professionals and leaders across the country who are looking to shift their literacy instruction to evidence-based practices through professional development work and conference presentation. He recently received his doc doctorate in educational leadership from Delaware Valley University and congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. So he's here today to talk about how to start this SOR thing in your school districts or schools, dist um, schools. and uh, I'll take it away, Ernie. Oh, well, thank you, Donna, so much for asking me to be here. It's always a pleasure. It's been a while and, and you know, when you go through the dissertation process, you are committing to uh, uh, going MIA for quite some time until it's done. So it's kind of, uh, I feel like I've, I've been freed from my self-imposed exile. <laughs> so it's, it really is a, a freeing experience. And so thank you so much for Welcome. the patience because I know there are times when uh, I wasn't as uh, responsive or as uh, engaged as I would have liked to have been with everyone in the silence of reading community. but. Thank you for everyone that's here for, for the, the lunch and lead series. I already ate my lunch. So if you brought yours, go right ahead and do so. I didn't think you'd want to see me eating my lunch while speaking as well. So that didn't, I don't think that was going to want to work for us, Donna, for me anyway. But yes, as Donna said, I, I the last five years, I was a building principal in the Centennial School District uh, in the part of uh, greater Philadelphia area, but I don't say I'm from Philadelphia. We live in Warminster. It is uh, considered... Um, uh, near the northeast part of Philadelphia. But prior to that, for 16 years, I was in the Allentown School District, which was a very urban school district in Pennsylvania, the third largest, might be fourth, third or fourth largest, give or take the demographical shifts that we have here. But uh, 21 years in public ed, and now I have the fortunate opportunity to work with uh, educators across the country with the AIM Institute, where we provide professional development and consulting in uh, providing evidence-based uh, literacy instruction and science of reading uh, advancement. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to share my journey to how I started with the shift from balanced literacy to structured literacy, because I always feel like it's really uh, uh, beneficial to hear the stories from others so that it can resonate with others who might be considering uh, making the shift themselves. I'm going to share my screen here. And if, uh, if you could just give me a thumbs up, if you can see my, my screen, I'm gonna find you. Oh, thank you, Andrea, yes. Thank you so much. Oh, Laura, she gave me the virtual thumbs up, perfect. All right, so instructional leaders as agents of change. And I am extremely passionate and fortunate to be able to work with educators with an emphasis on leaders in the science of reading, because I am really, really passionate about the critical role leaders play in the shift from balanced literacy to a structured literacy science of reading approach. So Donna, uh, you you gracefully, uh, uh, graciously, I should say, introduced me, so I don't need to go over through this slide, but again, I am the Senior Literacy Engagement Specialist at AIM Institute. That is my current role, and yes, Finally, I'm free of the doctor program. So the goals of this of this presentation, I'm I'm a big Simon Sinek fan, and I, I would like to believe many of you are very familiar with Simon Sinek and the golden circle. We start with our why, then we transition to the how, and then the what. 
So over the course of this presentation, I have that flowing theme of why understanding the science of reading. You know, how do we go about that? And I'm going to share my journey with regards to how that went. And then what, what are the results and what continues to happen from shifting to the science of reading because it never stops. All right, so understanding what is the science of reading. And I really appreciated when the Reading League worked with, the, with thought partners and advocates within the, the science of reading space to come up with uh, a common definition that many use and many cite, and I cited it in my dissertation as well, that we understand the science of reading as a interdisciplinary body of scientifically based research regarding how reading develops. And so with that being said, understanding that it's decades worth of research, it's not a recent phenomena, it informs us how proficient reading and writing develops. We, we talk about literacy. It informs us on why some children have difficulty with that process. And then how can we most effectively address those deficits within the school day? So with that understanding, why is leadership knowledge? Okay, teacher knowledge we know is important, but why does the leadership knowledge? Well, I always start with the teachers because the, during my time as principal, and I still believe this to this day that they're the most valuable commodity with regards to what you have in the school. Doesn't matter if you have a fancy new building, doesn't matter if you have a, a plethora of resources, the teachers are the number one resource and research supports that they have the biggest impact on student achievement. Now here you have your teacher here on the left, and then you have all the all the little kiddos here with the teacher. So this captures the impact this teacher has on these 20 students. Now I know you might be thinking, Ernie, what classroom has 20 students? I couldn't fit any more students. It'd be a little too little. So I just want to make sure you, you got the gist of it. So however, reading research, what we have on the left, which informs us, us educators, on how to effectively teach reading and the actual instruction that's happening, there's a disconnect there. And so that disconnect is due to insufficient training. So if you're familiar with uh, Kilpatrick's Essentials book and Mark Seidenberg's uh, book that he wrote back in 2017, they capture that in those two books right there. And there's a, a number of literature and, re and research articles that capture the disconnect between reading research and understanding how reading develops and the actual instruction. So with that said, recent research, and I mean recent, capturing the effectiveness of, of leaders and how they play a critical role in student achievement. I really appreciated the Wallace Foundation study that they released in 2021, that an effective principal yields about three to four months of student achievement, nearly as effective as, a, as the number one resource, which is the teacher. And then Schrader, Fox and Moan in 2020 spoke to how K2 principal knowledge matters when providing interventions for students who need that. So understanding the critical role that educators, the building leaders play with instructional leadership and then with uh, aligning intervention, think about the impact that has in a school, in a district. So understanding that principal leadership matters is one of the, is, is one that builds capacity of teachers. We are the ones who help support teachers in a way that really can move the needle and enhance the movement. So we support core, core instruction. We support the use of data and how to understand it. We link intervention and extend learning. So we serve as that. You know, when I when I started, it's really challenging for the uh, their, uh, the intervention specialists to deliver a message that really should be coming from the building leaders because you serve as a colleague to the teachers that you're working with. And I've had these conversations with my reading specialists, reading interventionists over my eight years as building leader. And so that understanding supports the messaging and expectations. And then of course, when you have this level of understanding, then you can maximize the professional development that you have at your disposal. As a building principal, I didn't have complete autonomy over all professional development hours, but I had some. So how do we align that? And having this level of understanding really helps. So back to the graphic. We have our effective teacher impact over here on the left, but then look at the effective principal impact, which then can impact all of these effective teachers, making effective teachers even more effective 
and making teachers who are absolutely trying their best to be more efficient and more impactful with their instruction. So the effect of an of a informed principal and informed building leader and informed curriculum development person within the central administration really goes a long way. So this is why I advocate and I'm so passionate about leaders having this understanding. It cannot be all on the teachers. They need that level of support. So leadership with central administration plays a role. I, I was mentioning curriculum director. As a building leader, we have a small portion of professional development time. As central administrators, when you're building the calendar, think of that professional development calendar over the course of the year. How are we leveraging those hours? And you know, a lot, a lot, I hear a lot that sometimes professional development is, 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 is tied to the curriculum that's being used. And I understand there needs to be some semblance of a professional development when you're using a particular resource. But the knowledge that we're talking about and the knowledge that I work to provide in terms of the professional development that I now work with regards to leaders, which I'll speak to in a little bit later in this presentation, it really is agnostic. It, it transcends any curriculum because then you could really maximize your teaching regardless of what resource you're using. So how do we align our time with professional development? How do we align our talent, super big, our resources in terms of um, the codables and, and other aspects of the curriculum? And then are we, use, are we maximizing our budget to support all those three things? because that's what we have to consider. So leadership, I'm hoping that with this understanding of the why with regards to the importance of leaders having this understanding, how it impacts all of these aspects of school planning, preparation, budgetary decisions, being fiscally responsible, and then ultimately what happens between entry and dismissal, because that's where we are measured the most and our impact with student achievement. So the, the why behind the reason leaders need to know this knowledge is because they play a critical role, second only to the teachers, with regards to student achievement. And they play a critical aspect that, quite honestly, teachers don't have the autonomy to de decide what resources they buy with regards to core curricular. And they don't have the autonomy, most teachers don't, to create their own schedule. So that's why this knowledge matters for leaders. All right, how do you go about changing the status quo? One of my favorite slides, because this is what happened to me. As I was a 13 year elementary teacher, if you look at the left, I had those little animals hanging in my room. Eagle eye, chunky monkey, and it took me some time. And I, I see some, some, I see Anne, you're shaking your head, yep. It took me some time as an educator myself to understand well, why shouldn't we be chunking words? I used to say that, you know, to my third graders, my first graders when I was teaching, I thought finding word, smaller words within words was a meaningful strategy, only to find out it wasn't. And, and then understanding those three cues, might not have known that's what that was caught at the time, but I absolutely did those things. The Describing to my students, this is what good readers do. We look at the first letter, you know, and, and, and we use meaning to figure out these words and understanding we're, we're shifting the paradigm here. That's why this magnifying glass is hovering over those theoretical frameworks there. You have the simple view of reading. It should not have taken me as long as it did for me to find out what that was. I was like in year 18. Yeah, oh yeah, the, the beanie babies for each of the reading strategies. Yep, that's right. We, my wife is the kindergarten teacher. She had those too. And then understanding how Hollis Scarborough's rope conceptualizes the simple view of reading. And so that right there, those two frameworks guided us with our MTSS process, guided us with data-driven decision-making, completely changed how we went about servicing our children. As a leader and anyone who's involved in the change process, it's critically important to understand what people are going to go through. I, I'm gonna present two change theories here for you to consider. First is Kurt Lewin's change theory from 1947. And it's pretty simplistic, 
where we go, the first stage is unfreeze. We need to unlearn what we've learned. Then we go through the moving process, which is where we're doing our new learning. And then this is where the leaders come into play. The refreeze. We can't have change unless we refreeze. And what that means is after we've unlearned what we needed to learn, well, unlearn, after we've moved through the learning process, we want to stay at that new stage and not revert back to old practices. That's the ideal process when we're going through change. And leaders play a really critical role in ensuring educators stay in that refreeze process or refreeze stage. A second theory I want you to consider is William Bridges' change theory from 1986. And I really appreciate his a slightly even more because he adds the human element of emotion. And if all I would imagine all of us here would agree that when it comes to reading instruction, there's a level of emotion tied to it. And when we discuss how we are making this shift, others have a level of passion and of emotion where they might be in this straight up denial. And then you have here on the left an ending, a loss, or a letting go. And it sometimes conflicts with their identity when we're asking them to let this go. So depending on where you are here on the left, you're going to go through this level of a process where you're letting go. You might be grieving. You might be in denial. And then eventually you'll hit the neutral zone, which is where you'll experience that new learning. And it's going to be a foggy area for you. You're going to hear some things that might contradict what you used to think and believe. But then you come out on the other end and it's a new beginning. Your career aha moment, which I experienced back in 2018, thanks to Emily Hanford. And depending on where you are, and I'm going to discuss this in the very next slide, you might not spend any time in a neutral zone. I think of some of my uh, teachers who were diving headfirst into the science of reading pool when we started introducing it. And I see, I see someone shaking their head. Uh, Deneen looks like you, you, you're, you're, it's resonating with you what I'm saying. And then you might have some people toward the bottom here who, gosh, they might not get to the neutral zone. I don't even have, it, it, the graphic expires, it finishes. They might never let go. And that's where I'm gonna discuss the difference between being a leader and sometimes having just set those expectations and being a boss and with the next slide. So with regards to how people accept change, we have the bell curve here of change. So leaders, we have to understand this. We have our innovators and our early adopters. Those are the two groups of people. And you can see they're not that many, they're not that big with regards to the entire group here. They're the ones who are going to dive head first into that science of reading and are, whatever you tell them, it's like, yes, yeah, you, are caps, you are conceptualizing and saying things that I've been feeling all these years. Then you have the early majority. They're the ones who will probably buy the new iPhone the second or third day it came out. While the early adopters and innovators, they're waiting in line prior to the store opening. Then you have the late majority who are going to wait a few weeks, maybe even a month to see if any of the kinks are worked out with this new product that we're talking about. The late majority is gonna see how the early majority and early adopters and innovators are with the science of reading movement and then come along. And then this last piece is when I, I just mentioned when we have to sometimes be the boss versus some a leader, the late adopters who are the people that we just have to make clear expectations. This is what's going to happen and understanding what is to be expected in the next two weeks, the next four weeks, the next six weeks. Always showing them a level of grace, but understanding that, okay, you, you're explaining to me that there might be still some level of uh, learning that is needed for you. We're going to set you up with the coach. We're going to build you up. But within the next four to six weeks, this is what we expect to see in there. Clear expectations. And again, it might not be something people like to hear, but the difference between being a leader and being the boss. And sometimes you got to be the boss and let those expectations be known. But those early adopters and innovators, man, they help you. They help you in such a way to move your building, to move your district, to move your organization, because you can't do it all as a leader. But you have to be mindful of who are those people that can help facilitate this messaging with you. And we have to develop a change vision. How are we going to convey to our educators, to our faculty and staff that the future is going to be different than the past? Well, I, I, I mentioned how the simple view of reading and Hollis Scarborough's reading rope really were the two 
biggest things that we use to help move forward and to facilitate this change. Prior to this, our MTSS meetings look something similar to this. And, and, and you know, I'll see uh, if, if this resonates with you. I have a concern here for Ernie. Oh, wait, yeah, what's the concern? Well, Ernie's reading on a level E. He should be reading on a level J. Wait, does, e, does J come after E? I hope so. Well, whatever letter comes after E, and you're smiling at me and I was put on the spot, but that's what it was. They're not really comprehending what, he's not really comprehending what he's reading. Um, I just really have some concerns. Okay. It went from that to something like this. I have really, I have some concerns about Ernie. Oh, what are those concerns? Well, orally, Ernie can segment and blend. Does that really well. But when we attach the letters to that process, he really struggles with the medial vowel sounds. Oh, all right. We can, we can identify some evidence-based strategies to help support that in an intervention. And then within the expectations of intervention, understanding that not every student needs to be seen by the reading specialist and that every student can be seen by the reading specialist. And that message must be clear because the expectation of classroom teachers providing that level of intervention is somewhat of a new paradigm shift. Hey, at least it's been my experience over here on the East Coast in Pennsylvania and other, other areas of the East Coast. Intervention being provided solely by the reading specialist is a thing of the past. We have to be, as all educators involved in that process, and I can tell you, I even had to chip in and, and participate providing interventions as a building principal, and I love my time doing that. Our assistant principal and I, we were providing intervention. It was only one group, but it was one more group that was receiving the services that they need, and we use these frameworks to help guide our, our instruction and, I, and I, our ability to identify skill deficits. Now, before you even can really go forward, you know, you, you, you want to honor the room because teachers are working hard. They're working so hard. So you don't want to be dismissive of the hard work that they're doing, but you also want to clarify, as I mentioned earlier, how the future will be different from the past. And we want to empower the teachers to take action. And you can only do that if there's trust and leadership because teachers will take action when they have a level of confidence that they, and when I say confidence, that they know that they can be vulnerable, that they can take risks in the classroom and that they won't get, it, it's not an I gotcha, it's a great, I have a suggestion or can I help you with this? And, and this is where I feel like the coaches really come into play. And if you're a coach on here, kudos to you because as a building principal, as much as I tried, as much as I really tried to uh, break down those barriers so that um, they didn't feel as if it was an I got you, they always saw me as their supervisor. They always saw me when I came in, even if it was just to say hi, a little nervousness. That's where the coaches come in to really help facilitate that, that moving forward along with the principals, never in a, and I got you as well, but definitely in a way to help be a team to move the school, to move the district forward. But that trust is key. We want to enable the teachers to take action. Well, there's a lot of barriers that could do that. And one of the biggest barriers is when a teacher approaches their building leader or maybe a curriculum director or whoever's in, uh, in a role of leadership with an idea, with a suggestion, and they get shot down right then and there. It can be very disheartening and deflating. But, so we want to be able to listen and, and support them. Well, how do we do that? Well, we want to support their knowledge base. That, that knowledge base is going to be one of the biggest things. Teacher knowledge and the science of reading will go a super long way. But on top of that, once they have that knowledge, they're going to need resources. How does that research translate into the classroom? That's where job embedded professional development comes in, your coaches. Shout out to the coaches on the call here. And then of course, scheduling and consistency within the schedule. When we looked at our schedule with the fine tooth comb, we were able to identify areas where we can improve to provide continuous literacy blocks and maximize those minutes, minimize transition, transition to lunch, transition to specials, transition from recess. Oh gosh, I can tell you, I can tell you right now, literacy instruction for kindergarten should never happen after lunch or recess because you're just gonna be wasting time with the, with, with, with the transition back and forth with that. So for me, I was a really big pro pro proponent for my K-1 to have literacy instruction in the morning as much as possible. Now. There might be some other factors. I know if you're sharing specialists with amongst buildings and whatnot, that might not always be the case. But when you could, when you can, that's something that you should consider. So identifying all these barriers 
that could be uh, preventing us from moving forward, but with the starting one of ensuring the knowledge is there. All right, so what were some of the aspects for us? What were some of the teachings that they, when they learned it, the very next day it was put into practice? And that's the question I get. So Ernie, if they learn these things, are they going, what's, what, what can I expect the very next day? Well, the oral language piece was huge. Absolutely huge. And understanding that oral language, that our brains wired to speak, listening and speaking, fall under that aspect. And then how written language, not a natural process, and that requires direct, explicit, systematic instruction. And I can tell you that wasn't happening for us. And we had to address that. Here are the uh, oral language systems that we were, we had some understanding of them, but I can tell you it wasn't a very clear understanding. I will admit I'm vulnerable with this space here and, and, and there's no shame and no blame until I really thoroughly understood the science of reading. Prior to that, I would not have been able to tell you the difference between phonemic awareness and phonics. I'm, not, I'm confident I would not have been able to tell you. It took me some time to even understand the differences between the two. Now, we understood aspects of these uh, uh, sub bullets under the six language systems, but I'm not sure, I, I'm not confident I would have been able to tell you which uh, of these bullets went with which uh, language system. I'm not convinced I could have told you that. And, and, and then understanding things like syllables. I mean, I knew what a syllable was, but I gotta be honest, I didn't know every syllable had a vowel. I had no idea, that was new to me. I didn't know there were six syllable types that will, could help us to really understand how to attack a multisyllabic word and that kids in kindergarten can learn open and closed syllables. So for me, as an educator, as a building leader, I had this sense of urgency that I needed this level of knowledge yesterday. My teachers needed it two weeks ago, and we needed to start making these changes, you know, the very next day. But with regards to when we learn these things, the conversations were there, and that's what one of the aspects that we were able to address right away. And boy, explicit and systematic instruction, specifically with phonics. Oh my gosh. I, I look back at it when we were doing a needs assessment. Well, first off, we didn't even have phonemic awareness. That was not happening at all. I, couldn't, I, I could not guarantee you as a parent that that was, ab that was absolutely happening. It might've been happening uh, sporadically here and there, but I couldn't pinpoint and say exactly it was happening. In terms of phonics, fragmented was what I would say. We were providing fragmented uh, inst phonics instruction on that as needed basis which was not acceptable once we had a better understanding. So within our instruction, we, we transitioned to the what. What did we address? I, I mentioned phonemic awareness, had to be addressed, wasn't happening. It actually was happening for students who were receiving intervention. Well, if they would have received it in tier one, they might not have needed intervention. Oh my goodness. That was just kind of like so frustrating for me. Explicit systematic phonics instruction supporting the connection of phonemes and graphemes and being really intentional with that, something that we weren't doing before. Being intentional with our vocabulary instruction and not simply identifying the most challenging words, being strategic with our word choices with regards to vocabulary and taking that tiered approach. And then the immediate corrective feedback, really, really important. Oh man, this was big, assessment. I'm, I'm sure many of you are going to uh, nod your head. We were doing the Fontas and Pinnell. We were shutting down instruction for a couple of weeks. And when I say a couple of weeks, it was probably like two to three weeks, each round of F and P stuff. And so, man, and then that was prior to COVID and we were still struggling to get subs now. I can't even imagine still having to do that. And so, and then what, what information was it giving us and understanding that we need information that's reliable and that's valid. And so we were really intentional and took our time, but with a sense of urgency at the same time to identify universal screener for us. Now, uh, we personally went with Dibble's eighth edition and, and have seen, when I say we, I know I'm not part of that school district anymore, but I still live here. So I'm always gonna say we, so bear with me. Uh, so uh, we understood that we needed something that was going to be uh, efficient and meaningful, give us meaningful data. One of the biggest, uh, aspects of that was understanding why it needed to be timed. And I had a number of teachers who would tell me, you know, what, Ernie, I see what the kids can do in the classroom. And that data from Dibbles, it doesn't jive with what I see. And it, it, it took that understanding of being uh, 
seeing students as having a knowledge, but not maybe being proficient. And having that conversation and understanding with the difference between the two was really, really something. And then the goal setting aspect with, the, our, with our universal screener, goal setting for me as the building principal, goal setting for our building, goal setting for the individual teachers. And you want to be tactful. And, and this is my caution for leaders. When you do goal setting, you want to pick a goal that's attainable, but slightly ambitious. Don't do something that's too attainable because then you're not really moving the needle, but then don't do something that's too ambitious where you're going to be deflating your teachers and, and your staff to, before you even start. So goals that are attainable, but slightly ambitious. For me, I, I framed it as this is our floor. Here's our floor. And, and for me, I, and I'll, you know, I'll share, I, I said, you know, we were looking at our zones of growth, which captures the growth the students were making when they came in. I didn't accept anything than less than 75% of your students will make at least, at least a year's growth in a year's time. Because how could you advocate for or argue otherwise that three quarters of your kids, uh, less than three quarters of your children are making less than a year's growth. And so with that, we made a, that was our goal. I felt it was attainable. I felt it was ambitious. Man, my teachers destroyed that goal. They, they and it was so, so re, rejuvenating for them because, you know, over the years, the, the, the MTSS triangle was slight, somewhat inverted, maybe more like a diamond, not a triangle. And so at the end of the school year, it was looking more like a triangle, which was awesome for us. And then understanding how we support our friends who are either some or at risk for reading failure, and then providing that level of intervention, being diagnostic, using decodable surveys, uh, being prescriptive with, you know, reteaching the skills that the students haven't mastered yet. And the biggest piece, progress monitoring, something that in the special ed space is not a new thing, but absolutely that expectation was somewhat of a newer expectation for our classroom teachers. And I say expectation because it had to be done. And if we had an MTSS meeting where concern was brought up and we didn't have reliable data, we didn't have that consistent data to measure that, that incremental change over time based off of the instruction they were getting, then we, we had to make sure that that happened. So again, this is why leaders' understanding of all of this really matters because those expectations are set and then you can follow up with them. But along the way, we're always celebrating the small victories. One of the first small victories was making sure kids were keeping the eyes on the words when they were decoding. I had a first grade teacher, I'll tell you a story. When we were first talking about the science of reading and they were like, oh man, yeah, wait, they, they, they shouldn't look at pictures. And so one of the, one of the um, challenges I asked my teachers, I said, when you see a student who's struggling to decode, take notice of their eyes and see what they do. The, I wanna say a day or two later, I had a first grade teacher approach me, Ernie, Oh my goodness, I saw Ernie Jr. over here. Well, I guess Ernie Jr. Jr. because I'm Ernie Jr. I saw Ernie Jr. Jr. over here. And, and when they got to a word they didn't know, I saw their eyes darting all over the place, looking here, looking there, and not looking at the words. And so we made it an effort to make sure that the students were attuning to the letters on the, in the words to decode instead of using other aspects of the story or of the page to the point where some teachers started covering up pictures. So, you know, really understanding the importance of that. Our phonemic proficiency skyrocketed. The orthographic piece was big. The importance of explicit teaching that was happening and, and word level reading, all instructional victories. And then within the systems, we were able to secure decodables. We were being uh, more prescriptive and di di diagnostic. And then our assessing and progress monitoring, really proud of where we were with that and, and where we're going still. And so with, when the change process continues, it becomes organic. I can tell you I had another teacher just a couple of weeks ago shopping at Costco. I'm not sure where you live, if you have Costco, but it's a great store, we love it. And at Costco, they had the Bob books. And she sent me a text and she was asking me, Ernie, these decodables here, these are good, right? These are the ones that we would want. And, and I said, yes, th those, are, those are good options. So, you know, teachers are always looking for a good deal. They're looking for a bargain. Well, she bought a couple of them and now they're in their class and her classroom library. And so that's when you know that the change process, this whole uh, movement has become organic and you have 
partnerships like we had with the AIM, like I was fortunate to have a partnership with the AIM Institute my last four years. That's how I knew about AIM. And I took the Pathways to Literacy Leadership and I took the proficient reading with the teachers and the teachers took it. You know, they took that coursework and that started with in one building and then they're going district wide. And so with that, on top of that, books like our, our, our book studies with the Kilpatrick book, we, uh, the book study sponsored by AIM, which was the student focused coaching book. Uh, Patan sponsored a book study with the structured literacy intervention book by uh, Louise Spear Swirling, which was awesome. Finding those opportunities. And as a building leader, if, you, if, I, if I had someone, I say, Dawn here, she comes up to me, I'm going to be in that book study. All right, I'll buy you the book as long as you participate. That's what I did. A small investment in the, in the time that they would take, because a lot of these book studies are in the evening, like seven to eight. So if you're willing to spend an hour for the next six weeks, every Wednesday night, participating in this book study, the very least I think we could do is buy them the book. That's just my opinion. And that's what I did. And you continue the change process, continue to honor the room, really important to do that. And, and I can tell you that we, you know, we identified an assessment, we bought, we bought the codables, we invested in PD, of course, and it's ever changing, identifying a core curriculum, looking at morphology in the upper grades, understanding reading proficiency six to 12, how do content teachers play a role? Just because you teach math, just because you teach science and, and social studies, doesn't mean that you're not a literacy teacher. I would advocate, especially if you're science and social studies, that's all you teach is literacy, right? And then with math, let's face it, how much of a math test are we eliminating if they can't read the test? So really understanding how you can support that throughout the entire day. Uh, you know, my specialists, we're working on uh, incorporating that into their the gym class, health class, art class, uh, digital literacy, uh, AKA technology, all of those really important. So here's my shameless plug with the AIM Institute for Pathways to Literacy Leadership. Again, I'm fortunate that I get to help support uh, building and district leaders and with their understanding and advancing the uh, science of reading and literacy based, evidence-based literacy instruction. And we, we go about doing that by a learn, practice and apply model. And so you learn the content, you practice it, and through our virtual communities of practices, you, you apply it. And I, I, I need to give a shout out to my Wisconsin friends out in CISA too, because we have a group that I'm, that's my first group that I get to work officially with here at AIM. We have a group, um, um, oh yeah, Mary Jo, I see you Mary Jo, I wasn't sure, but I, I see you there. And then, you know, we have some friends over there in Louisiana. We have friends in Ohio. And we're going to be starting a partnership with the entire state of Mississippi, working with two school districts out of New York City. And then, of course, my home state working in here in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Lori, I know that hits you near and dear to your heart uh, over here in the Bucks County area in Pennsylvania. But this is something whether your state has legislation or not. Some states do. Some states don't. In some states, it might be in its infancy. Schools educational agencies, districts across the country are not always waiting for the legislation and they're really excited to get this learn, practice and apply model. And I'm fortunate enough at AIM through my role as the senior literacy engagement specialist to help facilitate pathways to literacy leadership. And I get to work and, and, and apply what they're learning and practicing in our virtual, in our asynchronous platforms to create a plan that they can take back to their schools, their districts, their organizations to really move forward with evidence-based evidence literacy instruction. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I wanna say thank you to everyone who took the time to uh, have lunch and listen because really this is the important work that we're all here for. So thank you. And I'm here for the next 20 minutes if you wanna grill me and ask me questions. <laughs> Ernie, you packed. Well, don't more. grill me on the grill. Just ask me questions. How about that? <laughs> First of all, you pack more into that forty minutes than than I can believe. And second of all, you could have a stand up comedy gig if this 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 thing doesn't work out with AIM. You are a hoot. <laughs> Thank you. My kindergartners would think so. Oh well, I think so. <laughs> so okay. Anyone have questions, comments? Oh, I see a question from, from Rhoda and, and from Wisconsin. Will I be working with CISA 7? I believe so. We've been having some conversations with uh, some colleagues out there uh, and CISA 7. So I'm hopeful that is the case. We're, we're looking to put something together. So yes. 
So let me um, pony on that or piggyback. That's what I want, not pony, piggyback on that. We actually went through, an, uh, we are going through an AIM um, cohort right now. Uh, we were blessed to get a scholarship opportunity for just Wisconsin administrators. And I know Nancy Dressel's on, and she's in the cohort too. So talk about getting some leaders um, going in Wisconsin. We're so excited. Nancy, you want to add to that? Nancy. I know she's here. I'm hoping. Well, it is lunch and leave. Maybe she's eating her lunch, Donna. <laughs> Never know. Um, I see her, but I don't know if she's... Anyway, um, from Nancy. Okay, no oh. video or mic today. Sorry. Okay. Andrea, Andrea raised her hand. She's using technology. I see it. So what's up, Andrea? Thanks so much Hi. for today. This was really awesome. Um, Thank you. you touched on it a little bit, but my question is really about those ineffective practices or traditional mm. things that we hang on to. I've yeah. heard Mark Shin yeah. talk about like creating an abandonment list alongside of your implementation list. I've heard of districts like burning old materials, like having a bonfire and a going away. What did that kind of abandonment process look like for you? So excellent question. And I can speak to something that we just, I just had a conversation with one of my former first grade teachers. Remember I told you I had a teacher who reached out to me while she was at Costco, first grade teacher. And she said, okay, she bought the Bob book. She's organizing her classroom library. Ernie, what do I do? What do we do? I know you had a plan. What do we do with these predictable texts, with these um, um, predictable texts that are repetitive and and you know, what do we do with them? Well, there's a couple of things we could do with them. One, we don't wanna use them if the children still haven't cracked the code because then we'd be taking two steps forward and maybe one step backward that when they're with us, we're having attention to the, to the words, but when they're in, independently working, if they get a book that's predictive or, re, or repetitive, uh, like a predictable text, then they might be relying on the queuing system, which is something that we know is not supported by evidence. And so what do we do with that? Well. You, we can use that resource when the children are working with us, but not when they're independent. So that teacher and my recommendation was keep the books. There's information out there. Uh, we went on Reading Rockets. Uh, there was some other uh, available information on the, on the internet to help support other options from our friends in the space of known as the science of reading. But there were also other things I can tell you, like the benchmark assessment system, F&P. Right now it's collecting dust. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going as far to say you should have a, a party about, you know, this, that, or whatever, but at the same time, we know that we're just not leveraging them. And, and, and if you want to use something to that nature to capture as another data point, that's fine. You can do that on your own time. Heck, do it on your lunch, but you're not going to have classroom time, instructional time to be doing it. The expectation is these are the approved assessments. And quite honestly, we're not, we weren't using any of them. So it was just a matter of understanding the importance of the why of the resources, understanding um, what would the expectation was. And then quite honestly, as leaders, as coaches, leaders, as team leaders, understanding what we should be doing, what we should be abandoning and always having those questions and, and those conversations as we move forward. Chunky monkey was one for me. I, I got to tell you, Andrea and everyone else, I thought that makes sense to me. You know, you find a small word in a, in, in a bigger word. But then it wasn't really until someone was like, well, how do you teach some, Ernie? You're going to have kids finding so in me, and that's not going to help them. And then it's like my aha moment. You know, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess that does make sense. What about towel? They find the small word too. It's not going to help them. Right. Okay. So when you have those conversations, you have those aha moments, respectfully, tactfully, really important. It goes a long way. Excellent. Good advice. Anyone else? Oh, life changing. Nancy, Woo! did you see that in the chat? Aim Pathways to Literacy Leadership is life changing. It changed my life. It's my job now. I used to be a building principal. Now I'm here and I believe it <laughs> to be true. It is life changing. Um, it's been extremely motivating for the participants um, because they, you know, they're putting two and two together and uh, the course is I can't remember now 30 hours or 25 hours and and actually what you do is you walk away with a plan for mm -hmm. your district 
So yeah. it's not like you're just sitting and getting, you are actually applying your new knowledge to a plan that you can take to your district and get started yeah. on. And I'm fortunate enough to help you create that plan and serve as a thought partner. And when I say serve as a thought partner, and, and Lori, I see you and you've been uh, typing into the chat, that thought partner doesn't start when you are participate in the Pathways to Literacy Leadership, and it doesn't end when the coursework is over. I mean, I've been a thought partner with Lori Anderson for going on a couple of years now. And she's, and, and it's just because it's a genuine desire to help support, uh, uh, be a thought, a thought partner, be a partner for impact, help support a fellow educator who is of the like mindset to move forward with evidence-based literacy instruction. That's what you get with us here at AIM. Of course, we wanna support you with this literacy plan, but also support you beyond that because quite honestly, it doesn't stop. It's always ongoing. I see it as a relationship builder. And, yep. you know, once you have a relationship with these folks, you know, it's hard to not un to undo that. Right. So Annie F a Pfeiffer, new my new best friend. <laughs> Hi, right? Donna. Hi, so my question for Ernie is how do I get you to talk to my principals? I need you. Yeah, I have so, a whole district of principals, and we're all just starting. Well, not all of us, but mm -hmm. we're starting, and we need you. So, Annie, it's Annie. Annie, yeah. Okay, Annie, you. I'm gonna give you my. I'm gonna put my email in the chat here. Okay, perfect. It's. I'm just an email away, and okay. Lori will tell you. I we meet on the weekends. We would meet on the weekends, and she, Lori's in Denver. Oh man. <laughs> Denver, Colorado. I'm in Pennsylvania. So we would meet and, and we coordinate our calendars because I think two hours behind one hour, you're definitely behind where I am on the East coast. Yeah. And so, and, and we meet and we do it because quite honestly, it's important work. And if I'm fortunate enough to, that our organizations can collaborate, great. But I look at it as like you said, Donna, a relationship and in terms of supporting each other's a collegial relationship like-minded people where we don't see obstacles we only see opportunities annie you got my email even if it's just a conversation where i i can hopefully just have a sit down with them great that that'd be awesome now i see a question from danisa lopez how do how much of this information should families know a good amount of it and i will another plug for aim is we've created uh first step modules that are not as intensive as the, the, the our Pathways Proficient uh, reading, but they're absolutely something that would provide that level of first step and knowledge of the science of reading. But they, I, I can just tell you, the other day I went out to dinner with a friend of mine who has a four-year-old who will be turning five, and in Pennsylvania, when you turn five before September 1st, you're in kindergarten. And he, he was telling me, yeah, my son, you know, we're reading a book and, and he's reading the words, but he's looking at the pictures and that's fine. And I said, whoa, pump the brakes, bro. Let, you know, let's have a conversation about that. And, and we, we had a really good conversation. And it was respectful. I'm not saying, you know, like, I'm glad he's reading books with, with his son. But at the same time, understanding the, the, the why behind that might be something to, to avoid if possible. And he was just, just from that point, we had a 30-minute conversation. He was grilling me because he wanted to make sure that his son was set up to be successful because he understood what it was like for him as a struggling reader when he was growing. This is my best friend from uh, when we graduated from our public school district over here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So absolutely, parents should have this level of, um, oh, and absolutely for school board members too. I agree with that, Nancy. And so, uh, Denise, uh, definitely should know a level of importance in terms of phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, how they can set up their children for success. And even as they get older, what they could do as look for, uh, you know, in terms of why it's so important that these foundational skills need to be strengthened as they get older to uh, upper intermediate, which are, you know, three, four, five into the middle to high school grades. And so absolutely, there should be some level of knowledge building. And I can tell you that the school that I just left, they're continuing the parent engagement nights that we that we had prior to COVID and that we tried to maintain during COVID virtually to educate the community. Oh, Deneen, we, we, oh, yes. Okay, I can speak to that if you don't mind, Donna, about Deneen. She's asking about the Pathways to Literacy Leadership I'm, platform. I'm get up right yeah. now so I can give her a link. Okay, you do. You got the link. I'm going to speak to it, Deneen. Our Pathways to Literacy Leadership platform, and I got to just be transparent. This is not why Donna asked me. That. I would have done this even if I wasn't going to be explaining this, but what it is for leaders, 10 modules, 10 asynchronous modules, and then during the course of those 10 asynchronous modules, 
there are four 90 minute sessions with a facilitator, myself, my wonderful colleague, Cindy, Dr. Cindy Hadicke. There's another colleague that we have, Jasmine Landry, that helps facilitate these live sessions where we dig deeper into certain aspects of the modules. We, we unpack the learning that's in there. And then like Donna mentioned, we create, a, a, we work on creating a plan, a plan that then the leaders can take back to their organization, their schools, their districts, and, and work on implementing what it is that they're learning. I can tell you, I got off a call this morning with the school district in New York. The leaders are going through the platform first. They're getting a head start with some early adopter teachers. So you have two cohorts of leaders, two cohorts of teachers, and then they have 21 cohorts starting uh, several months, like two months after them so that they can all be moving forward with this shift. Outstanding, but asynchronous learning supported by synchronous meetings at a time that we work on to, to really uh, accommodate. And so I'm working with Wisconsin folks, which is awesome. CISA too, shout out again. And you know, they're an hour behind us. We'll work with people on the West Coast. I stay up late, it's all good. So you know, let us know. And Donna left the link in there, great. It's a great course, fabulous. Yeah. And I'm also gonna throw in the first steps in there, Donna, uh, for anyone who might be interested in learning about the first step modules which are really geared for, think of like paraprofessionals, uh, content area teachers, six to 12 parents, to Nancy's point, school board members, absolutely. I'm not familiar with those. Oh, they're hot. They're, they're, those are the aspects that we're using with the micro-credentials. Oh, oh, oh yeah. the first steps. Oh, I'm familiar yes. with those. I, the yeah, yeah. Is, and yep, the and, and then we are, we're partnering with someone named Donna, and, and, and Lori <laughs> Severino to get those micro-credentials with yep. our first step that's right. modules. I forgot that's what we call them. I'm using that's a right. bit. Yeah, I'll catch on. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, Donna. Got my back. Okay, any other questions? All right. This has been fabulous. Thank you so much. Oh, I hope everyone has a great Labor Day weekend. You deserve it. Unplug. After this, I'm going to do my final fantasy football draft. Oh, can't wait. All right. And this will be sent to you, this recording. It's all good. And it'll also be on our YouTube channel under Lunch and Lead, I think is what we call it. <laughs> That's what we call it, Lunch and Lead. All right. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ernie. That was fabulous. Oh, Donna, it was my pleasure. It was awesome. You're so good. All right.